Good day, everyone, and welcome back to TVUP's Health Issues. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa. And because of our previous episode on molecular biology, we are bringing back Professor Cynthia Saloma to discuss the role of the Philippine Genome Center and all the people that have trained in molecular biology in this fight against this pandemic. Welcome back, Professor Cynthia Saloma. Thank you so much, EVP Ted, for having me again. Okay, thank you for joining us again. We had a very exciting story in the last episode on how the Philippine Genome Center, the National Institute for Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, and the many people you've trained have become a fixture in the University of the Philippines. Now let's talk about the pandemic called uh, COVID-19. And in the beginning, the, the COVID-19, we were sending our test samples to a virology lab all the way in Melbourne, Australia. So they said that a test needed to be done and it was called the RT-PCR. What is RT-PCR? Okay, so uh, in simple terms, uh, the meaning of RT-PCR. So RT means reverse transcription or reverse transcriptase, polymerase chain reaction, so RT. And the reason we do RT-PCR is because for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the genetic material is not DNA, but RNA. So from RNA template, you need to trans reverse transcribe it to DNA first, and then you can do uh, multiple copies of it in a process called polymerase chain reaction. So you need to have That's an the reverse transcription part. Correct. Yeah, so you need to use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So there's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So first you have to extract the total RNA from the virus using different kinds of kits. It can be automated, it can be um, magnetic beads. And then from the total RNA, you have to reverse transcribe using an R a reverse first transcriptase. Step, the first step is to extract the RNA, which is the core genetic code of that virus. Correct. It has to be an RNA virus, so they don't have DNA. Correct. Unlike humans and animals, we have... DNA, DNA as our genetic material, our genetic code, which is again uh, changed into an mRNA Correct. To proteins in our body. Correct. Now, uh, this one, you from the mRNA virus, you extract the, the RNA, mRNA, and then you reverse transcribe uh, it using an enzyme to a DNA sequence, which eventually you go through what is called amplify. A amplify cup, multiple amplify, copies, extraction, uh, reverse transcription. Amplification. Amplification. Correct. Yep. So, yes. so that you can now identify the sequence, the correct sequence. If correct. It is the identity of the virus you are trying to. Yes. Find. And what happened, uh, AVP Ted, is uh, during the process of amplification, the primers have been uh, conjugated to a fluorescent uh, material. So you can do real time. You can do real time uh, observation of the process of amplification. So much so that when multiple copies are being made, you can see it in a graph. No? So they, they call it a real time RT PCR because but that. Sometimes we use RT. So yeah. RT also as real time, but it's actually real-time RT-PCR. So some call it Q-PCR. Uh, quantitative PCR. So in so quantitative PCR, essentially, you can, you can have, a, um, you have some values where you can uh, compare it to so that you can quantitate. But for the RT-PCR, the uh, real RT-PCR that we're doing for uh, SARS-CoV-2, it's not really quantitative, but qualitative. Qualitative. Yeah. So, so this is the confirmatory test. Now we know the Department of Health and all the infectious disease experts to diagnose SARS-CoV-2, you need to do RT-PCR. PCR. described how a molecular biologist does that. And because of that, the country spent money to build several molecular laboratories. We had... <laughs> smorgasbord of building molecular bi uh, laboratory. More than 200. More than 200. Now 300 now. Wow, 300. 300. <laughs> so we're we now to 300 molecular laboratories yeah. from zero, from, uh, from just one uh, molecular lab to test uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, which was RITM. Yeah. How did your graduates and people who trained in molecular biology 
help all of these molecular laboratories? Oh, so um, just to share with you the story, in the early part of the pandemic, there was only our ITM that was doing it. So you can expect that it was also, of course, inundated with samples. And because of that, the turnaround time was slow. Some people were getting it at nine days or 10 days later. So there was really an imperative to increase the nation's capacity for testing. Since we are molecular biologists and RT-PCR is something that we do often, we help uh, together with the Department of Health increase capacity. So for this, together with NIH, because the National Institutes of Health has a biosafety um, uh, institute or biosecurity institute. So they already have an online, they already have a program for biosafety and biosecurity. And from the MBB side is the hands-on training. So we have faculty members like Dr. Pia Bagamasbad, for example, who created a manual so that we can train people um, and come over so that we can help them how to do RT-PCR. And EVP, we're very, very thankful that because, you know, if you're going to get grants from somewhere, it will be take time. We got money from the university, remember? We were so nice. Uh, the university gave us about 1.4 million to be able to train uh, a lot of these medics. I think at least 28 labs were capacitated in the national capital region alone. They got their licenses, and so they trained with us. And, and then, of course, we segue into, uh, into an online version. And it is very nice that we also have a Philippine Genome Center in Visayas and in Mindanao, because then they can also help train people from there. They don't have to come to Manila. But in the beginning, oh, it was really heartwarming to see so many of our graduates um, and our graduate students and our alumni helping, volunteering to volunteering. different labs. Yes, we volunteer. They volunteer. We had to provide hotels for them and Correct. Uh, service so that they could volunteer in our ITM, the National yeah. Task Force, help coordinate yes. that. Uh, you sent me someone who was coordinating with me to help yeah. out that, that Correct. group. Yeah, and, and uh, we house them in some of them. We house in this men. Yes. We house them in this men. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and what many people don't realize is they were frontliners too because they are exposed yes. to the samples Correct. of the virus. And some of them even get, got infected with COVID-19 as well because it's very dangerous. The extraction part is the most dangerous part of this process wherein you can, uh, you can inhale the, the virus while uh, handling all the specimens. Yeah, right? so th that's why it was very important for them to all get the biosafety certification that was done in NIH. So doc Dr. Eva Cotionco de La Paz, uh, as her NIMBB, and also at the Philippine Genome Center, we, we uh, banded together. And sometimes when we had reagents, we lack reagents, people from the Institute of Biology, Institute of Chemistry also lent the reagents to us, particularly for our RNA extraction. That was really, really difficult to get in the beginning. So uh, everybody was just so nice helping each other. So we were able to have volunteers in San Lazaro Hospital, in Lung Center of the Philippines, in RITM, and also here at NIH and there in NIH and also here in uh, in the Philippine Genome Center. So, so many people also help, for example, transport them and provide food for them. And we had to vaccinate all of them through donation. Yeah. And EVP, probably many people may not have realized it, but the diaspora, the alumni of MBB, the, uh, actually raised about 3 million pesos to help that effort. So we were able to, to buy vaccines for influenza for the frontliners. And then, of course, some lab gowns, you know, their scrub suits, and to repair some areas in the Philippine Genome Center where we needed cash because that was a time when people or suppliers will not do anything unless you pay in cash. cash so that, right. yeah, that was really, we cannot procure using the normal government procurement process. So the donations from um, alumni and from friends were really, really instrumental for us to get going. Eventually we improved and improved and we have more licensed labs. And then we were, the, the DOH was now able to pay for the med techs and so on and so forth. But can you imagine um, our, medical technology as a degree program is not really was not really, they're not really trained to become molecular biologists or to do a lot of this rt pcr work right um 
They're more uh, traditional in terms of uh, technique. Microscopic work. Yeah, microscopic work. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, lab work is chemical and colorimetric, yeah. right? But to be able to do, you know, pipetting one microliters, two microliters, and to use the pipeter properly, that was a challenge. And also because it's an RNA. And RNA, of course, everybody knows it's unstable, right? It uh -huh. has to be done very fast. So, And because this is a highly infectious material, it has to be done in neg negative pressure lab, you know? with all this PPE. So there was a protocol when everybody needs to be trained on how to wear the proper gear, the proper PPEs. So that was part. And there was an exam from the National Biosafety Committee, uh, National Biosecurity from NIH. They also have an online module and as well as hands-on module. And then we also have hands-on um, training here at, at MBP. So that was great because uh, the university through the genome center, the NIMBB, and, and the other colleges also biology and chemistry, and also the uh, all the other genome centers in the UP system. Yes, help, help. Remember and, the genome center yeah. in, now in uh, the Visayas in Los Baños were all contributing. Yes, correct. And also EVP, we also lent our equipment, by the way. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. So, for example, Dr. Ray Garcia lent his uh, ultra-low freezers. And, right. of course, it's Biosafety Cabinet to Lung Center. And some of our friends helped uh, lent their RT-PCR machines. I saw our RT-PCR machine in Tagum when I visited it. As yes, part of yes. This is from UP Mindanao. So there yeah, was... and UP Visayas to the Western Visayas Medical Center. They also yeah, learned. I, I also saw that. I also <laughs> and the <laughs> CIFDEC, yeah, and the CIFDEC people in our network of uh, the molecular biology. The CIFDEC people were uh, donating their filtered tips to the testing oh. labs. That was really nice. And Philippine Carabao Center, whatever they have, they also sent to us. There was also something else in testing that we were able to contribute, but didn't make a wave later on. But I thought it was actually good. Uh, we, we had our doctor, our uh, deputy director, develop a uh, PCR uh, kit. So can yeah. you tell us the story of that? So uh, Dr. Raul Destura, um, who is also the, the director, by the way, of the biosafety, the Institute for Biosafety and Biosecurity of NIH, he developed a RT-PCR kit that is really based on the primers of the charity um, group in Germany, right? So our role at the Philippine Genome Center was really to help validate it, meaning to say they had enrolled patients who tested positive and we sequenced them. We sequenced their result, RT-PCR using a different um, um, capillary sequencer. And those which did not test positive, we also sequenced whole the, in metagenomics to see whether they missed out. No? So that was a, a time um, when we had to to help in the validation process. But I think Dr. Raul created a version two, right? They created a version two, which we are using today. So that was the Gen Amplify yes. uh, NCOV, NCOV uh, detection kit. So well, that was also our first part. No? And it is purely local and- Yeah, uh, and no, very, very affordable. Laboratories, yeah. There is no need to import. And I think he also had a competitive price because this yeah. was- and it's getting cheaper and cheaper as the days continue. So it's really, really competitive now. Because before, that supply chain was a little bit difficult right? Uh, in the beginning. Sure. One of the other things developed by DOST funding yes. and for Genome Center, wherein there's a spin-off and there's a private company. Called Manila Health Tech. Right? Manila Health Tech is his supply company. Now, okay. let me ask you about uh, how viruses behave. They mutate. So what is the mutation? And what is what is a variant? What yeah. Is, okay, so yeah, a lot of people are always asking what is the difference between a variant, a mutation, as well as a strain, right? Mm -hmm. So okay, so when you say a mutation, it can be a thing, a change in the nucleic acid sequence of uh, material. So food. That, that, yeah, uh, yeah. So you have sequence of letters. If there is a change there, that is called a mutation. A mutation can be an insertion, a change, a deletion. Yes, and it can also be a. It can also result into a deleterious change, meaning to say there will be a structural change with implications on function, or it can also be a neutral mutation. So not all mutations actually are deleterious or harmful. Some mutations are just normal. Uh, uh, neutral. And of course, a virus mutates as a normal process of its evolution. 
You remember, this is an RNA virus, and every time it copies itself, so a reverse transcribe, there is always an error. But the error is not so much compared, for example, to HIV and influenza. SARS-CoV-2 is not as error prone as um, influenza as well as uh, HIV. But at okay. any rate, and the yeah. influenza oh, they mutate faster, probably five to 10 times faster than SARS-CoV-2 because the SARS-CoV-2, so this is an RNA virus and every time it multiplies, a mutation could happen. And when it jumps from host to host or let's say from person to person. So viruses um, really mutate as part of its normal evolution. So that is called a mutation. So then that's if why have, in public health we say, if you want to stop transmit, if you want to stop mutation, stop transmission. Very, very important because without a host, a virus cannot mutate. Cannot mutate, yes. Correct. And then, what is a variant? A variant, a variant now is a virus having those mutations. Okay, so. Remember the term, uh, Professor. Strain, young strain. Clay, clay, clay. Clay, oh, clay, clay. Clay. Is a clay. So, so clay in the we make a tree. In the evolution of the virus, you can make a tree based on the comparison of the genomic sequence, right? So you have a root of the tree, which is probably the original one from Wuhan, China. So we call that as a root. And then the moment it mutates, it creates branches and branches and branches. And sometimes in a particular branch, you have several variants there that forms a clade. So like a big family or a big branch of the tree, we call it a clade. So, parang magpipinsan na variant. Mag correct, correct. Oh, variant oh. Yes. That's Probably had two variants in the same loci. Correct. The, oh. So, you know, normally in the clade, when they classify it, there are some common mutations they possess. So, how is a variant different from a uh, strain? Okay, so what is a variant? So, oh, no, in media, I see media people interchange. Yes, correct, because it's really, yeah, it's very tempting to say variant and strain interchangeably. But when you talk about strain, we refer to the big ones, meaning to say SARS CoV 2 strain, MERS strain, and uh, SARS CoV 2 strain. Okay, yeah, the SARS CoV 2, these are the strains strain of the, cor of the coronavirus. coronavirus. Yes, yes. A major and, uh, and they say a strain once there is a change in the functionality. The functionality. So if you notice, SARS, the original, behaved differently than MERS COVID yes. and MERS COVID and the two behave differently than Correct. Uh, SARS COVID 2. Yes. Correct. So while they, for example, even in symptomatology, sometimes they are similar, but in terms, for example, of um, death rate very very different so uh, the most pathogenic of course is MERS which mm -hmm. has probably 35 to 40 percent uh, uh, death death uh, for for the moment a person is infected for SARS CoV the one the original one that was uh, famous in Hong Kong that one is about nine to ten percent and this one the the range is about two to four percent so depending on the journal it's four percent others say it's two percent so this is not as Deadly or as fatal as MERS. But in the public health perspective, we oh. are we are scared more of this low mortality like influenza because it continues to propagate and transmit. Spread and, and spread it, until it reaches viruses, they kill the host and then they disappear. Yeah, so Stop it's not, yeah, that's correct. Oh. You're very correct, uh, EVP, because it's not good for the virus to die. So yeah. A very fatal virus is not good for its propagation. You know, if you think it about disappear. Um, it, will disappear. Yeah, disappear. It will disappear. So, so the, the the most dangerous ones are the ones which are just there in the surface, spreading and spreading. And when it catches or they catch a very uh, sensitive host or a one with comorbidities, then that's the time that it becomes fatal. So, this is. Um, we are increasingly seeing this in SARS-CoV-2. It is yeah. mutating in a way that it is improving its fitness to the human host. So we, we get to that point where in uh, sometime in November, the UK, which is already vaccinating, I think at that time they started to vaccinate already with Pfizer and they found parts of South London still, you know, transmitting the virus and uh, propagating very hard. And uh, there you go, you develop the uh, UK variant. So tell oh, us about was, uh, Yeah, the UK variant was first yeah. discovered in Kemp. So in Kent, England. So sometimes they care. So um, some people are saying, and the WHO discourages us from using the places 
of the virus as nomenclature. But since people cannot remember the numbers, uh, sometimes you have to use the place. So, so the B117 or the B.1.1.7 is also called AKA the UK variant or also the Kent variant. And the reason they so it can because there's already a subvariant called Bristol and Liverpool. So these are these are UK variants with a 484 mutation. Okay, so that was found. So when they look at their database, they discovered that um, it was found late September, about September 20, the first mm -hmm. one, no, September 20. But it really came into the picture because in December, there were a lot of cases. And then when they sequenced it, oh, it has this telltale mutation called the N501Y. It had the N501Y. So the UK variant does not have the E484K mutation. It only had the N501Y mutation, the P681H mutation, and the particular deletion. So what was concerning about the UK variant was number one, it was associated with a spike in cases in England, number one. And number two is the mutation occurs in the receptor binding site. The D614G, which is practically uh, all over the world now, which um, appeared and spread in June, is also was also associated with increased transmissibility. But on top of the D614G mutation, there was also this uh, mutation in the N501Y. And what is uh, concerning about the N501Y, in contrast to the D614G, is the location of the mutation is in the region that contacts the ACE2 receptor. So what is the ACE2 receptor? This is the receptor in the human cell upon which the virus enters. So there are data that indicates that it seems to be that this mutation allows the virus to hold on better to the um, host cell. And that has been associated with probably a 50% increased transmissibility yeah. with the N501Y. So that was the um, UK, we call it the UK variant, which actually has a lot of children now, <laughs> Bristol and Liverpool, because it mutates. And interestingly, you know, this virus in different parts of the world, why is it that they have the same mutation in the same location? For example, so we, we, we could call it as a process of convergent evolution. So for example, the one we found um, first described in the Philippines, it was a E484K. So the nickname for that is the Eek mutation <laughs> because E484K, so Eek mutation. Of course, South Africa has theirs in December. Probably it started last October and then spread in December in, um, in the Nelson Mandela Bay. So that was also the B1. 351 or the so-called first described in South Africa, that one has an E484K mutation. The one in Brazil, and this is very interesting in Brazil because the first wave in Manaus, Brazil, they when they did um, antibody testing, they think that the people there are 75% infected in Manaus, Brazil. And then they had a second wave. And when they sequenced the virus, it had this P.1, no? it is now called P.1 variant, where they had a mutation, number one, in the E484K region. It had that mutation. It also had the UK um, N501Y mutation. So it had the two mutations. And yeah, they, it suggests uh, probably EVP that it be, it, can be associated with reinfection, meaning to say there is a very likely possibility that the E484K, and they also have another one, the 417 region, could change the virus in a way that uh, the host immune system, it can evade the host immune system, even those who were uh, originally affected by the original strain, the, you know, the old strain. So that was really the concern for the P.1 mutation. And, uh, so, so to be clear, no, uh, you're describing all these mutations. People don't know that uh, the Philippine Genome Center was actually doing biosurveillance prior to the old. Yes, correct. So yes. can you tell us? Because you were telling me you were giving me reports of uh, returning Filipinos, and then you you sequence, you do a full genome sequence on them. So the RT PCR does only a segment. Correct, of, correct. Yeah. But still, the expensive test, which is a full genome sequencing, which you do. Uh, I, I think you told me it takes so long. How long does it take to do full genome sequencing? Probably three days, no? Three days. Three days, huh? and you uh, were doing... But if, it is, if you don't have a lot of samples, EVP, we can do it overnight. If 25 samples, okay, 30 samples of, overnight, yes. But it's expensive if you do little. 
Small and number, expensive. Many, cheaper. <laughs> so in the beginning, you were uh, watching already this mutation. In fact, oh, yes. I saw your graphs. I saw your clades and uh, yes. it was presented to me by some of your people. Uh, and then you were also able to identify uh, the roots of infection, entry, roots of entry. The, uh, what do you call this? The epidemiology, the biological Correct. epidemiology of where our uh, viruses came from. In fact, you Correct. had a promise that some came from Germany, some came from... Yeah, Europe. so when we were doing... Uh, you remember EVP, we were part of the validation of the UP kit, uh, mm -hmm. the MTEC and IH kit. So when we did the validation, we were given the opportunity to, as part of the protocol, <laughs> we were sequencing about 500. No? We were sequencing about 500. No, they did RT-PCR testing. We sequenced about 125, 125 whole genomes, no, um, or, or samples of the patients who volunteered through the Philippine General in the Philippine General Hospital. And then when we were doing the sequencing, we realized that the many that many of the whole genome sequences there were actually very similar to the Diamond Princess cluster. Okay. So so. Uh, but, but when we go to, to the history of the patients in PGH and our infectious disease, yeah, we were, Dr. Right. Isa, they never traveled. They were never. So that was in the community. And take note that this was March 22 to 26. So we repatriated, we repatriated our 495 seafarers from the Diamond Princess and they went to Clark, right? They went to yes. Clark. So we have 495 um, seafarers, but it is perplexing. How come we have many in the community having similar sequences? Sequence. Very so, yeah, so very, very interesting. So number one- It's either a de novo or someone escaped and uh, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're the people guarding <laughs> that. So, so EVP, be, be it being a de novo is not, not very likely because okay. we have several signature mutations. They cluster very closely with um, the Diamond Princess cluster. And you remember there was a time that some people suggested that they were came, coming from India. Uh, we yes. would like, yeah, we had to correct that notion. Yes, the wrong. one that were submitted by India also most likely came from the Diamond Princess because the Diamond Princess had many seafarers from India yes. and yes. the Philippines. I see, I see. Yes. So that's clear. So, yeah. so now we had this outbreak of uh, B117 in the UK, and everybody gets scared because there's yes. a, the media, mainstream media, tells a story of a new strain when in fact, you knew about these strains and you were following them up. So suddenly, the people clamored the Department of Health to do biosurveillance because they said, we will do biosurveillance. And unfortunately, <laughs> the only ones that can do biosurveillance were three institutes. The RITM, which has a very small sequencing machine. The NIH, which also has a small sequencing machine. And your very modern uh, genetic sequencer, which was told to me by... Eva Cochoco de la Paz and Chancellor Menchit, uh, better than the one in France. We visited the genome center. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the same one. <laughs> the higher end. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So, EVP, that what happens was sometimes many governments they buy this equipment, and then all these equipment makers they make a new version of it. So, you cannot buy a new one because you just bought the old one. <laughs> the old one. So, uh, so, so we, in our case, we have this Nova 6 6000. It's a very powerful machine. Powerful. That's why we can do 750 or 3000 at a time. So, Many people were saying why we are doing 750 only, right? I said, you should be perplexed that we can do 750 at a time. Because before we were only doing one, two, three at a time, not 750 all in all. So uh, we had that. And all the time. Maybe we should run through how the full genome sequence. Okay. So because the media always asks me, why is the government not doing more? biosurveillance and why can't they increase so can yes you the so this is the process of the sequencing so you remember you remember we need to have to isolate the virus using a, a kit it can be automated it can be manual so from the rna we need to reverse transcribe it to dna using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase now from rna to dna and then we have to do several rounds of pcr so how do we do this uh, evp 
in the beginning, what we did was we just sequenced everything and bioinformatically, we just looked for the virus in a process called metagenomics. We realized that for our for uh, virus, for SARS-CoV-2, if you do metagenomics, there is a lot of um, possibility that you cannot pick it up. Why? The moment you act, Actually extract the RNA, you are not only extracting RNA of the virus, you also extract human RNA, materials yes. and contaminating RNA. So if we want to sequence only the virus, we need to enrich the sample. We call that sample enrichment. So that means prior to sequencing, we actually do PCR amplification of the entire virus using overlapping primers. But if we are going to do 750 at a time, each sample should have its own barcode, meaning to say it has own, its own signature and its own signature so that when they are together, we can actually, at the end of the sequencing, we and during bioinformatics analysis, we can demultiplex. So from an RNA, you know, you have an RNA virus, you make it into a DNA, you subject it into many rounds of PCR so that only the virus sequence is enriched. Okay, and then for each sample, you have to have a barcode to say this is sample A, sample B, sample C. So for 750, they have to be actually barcoded, meaning to say there are signature sequences for sample A, B, C, and D. And then we subject them to DNA sequencing. So just for sample enrichment, EVP is really, really very tedious because it's a very, several rounds of PCR. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and then after so, that, we yeah. bring them to the machine. Correct. The machine. Genome only, sequencer, the genome yeah, sequencer. The, the genome sequencer, this more than 50 million machine, <laughs> probably 80 million machine. So million we place pictures. it there and it will run for about 12 hours. It used to run for 24 hours. Now it can run for 12 hours. Then we run it for 12 hours. And then, of course, the moment the sequences are there, off it goes to the bioinformatics core facility. They will analyze the sequences, meaning to say they will demultiplex. So they will try to assemble all letter A's, sample one, sample two, sample three, sample four. And then they will see whether the sequence quality is good. And then they will assign a lineage. So that is the first part. So immediately after that, we gave it to the DOH. Now the question arises, why cannot we make more? Why is it that only Philippine Genome Center is doing the DNA sequencing, right? Number one, you need to have a special equipment for that. Number two, you need to have very trained manpower for DNA sequencing. And it's not easy to train people for this one. RT-PCR is delicate enough, and this is many, many times more complicated than RT-PCR. And then you need to have a team for bioinformatics to analyze the sequences. So it's a whole team doing this work. So in the Philippine Genome Center, for example, you have a team for clinical genomics doing the extraction in the negative pressure lab, right? And then the RNA is turned over to a team that will do the reverse transcription and the uh, prime enrichment of the sample so that only the viral sequences are amplified. And then that will be given to the DNA sequencing core facility for sequencing in the expensive equipment. After the sequences come out, it has to be turned over to the bioinformatics core facility to make sense of the sequences that came out of the machine. So can you imagine the whole team doing this? And that is just first part. Afterwards, we have to analyze mutations, relationships, and that's why we were able to detect, for example, P.3, B117, and so on and so forth. And we can also detect, for example, if if they are in a cluster, most likely this came from this person, this came from this person, this came from this person, if the sampling is uh, he um, st uh, heavy enough. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's correct. So, so you report all your findings as a genomic center. You even share your data and your findings to other genomic centers in the world. As you said, this is a very small community. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. So everybody shares their samples. Like yeah. Japan has identified the P3 variant. So has the UK yes. because you gave them because yeah. you gave them that you found this particular variation. So before we upload uh, EVP, before we upload our sequences, we have to get seek permission from the Department of Health as to whether or not it's okay to upload. And that, for example, the metadata. Normally, the metadata we include is only the the place where the sample was taken and also the time when it was taken. So those are uploaded. So before we upload our sequences, we seek permission from the DOH and then we upload.
but there's now a relationship between the Philippine Genome Center and the Department of Health Epidemiology and Bureau, uh, yes. Also to try to consolidate your report. So Correct. unison, so that the fight for COVID is a uh, uh, collaborative and not you know Correct. individual. Yeah, it's really a partnership between the government, uh, us, and the acad academia, and also the partnership between the many labs, private and public, all over the country, who send their samples to us. So, Professor Sinja, what is the situation now? I saw a recent report of the DOH, which uh, charted the numbers of uh, B11K, the numbers of P3, the numbers of the Brazilian, the South African. Sabi nga nila, parang Miss Universe, meron lahat representatives. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, EVP, those were just the variants of concern or variants under, under investigation. Prior to this, actually, we had many, many uh, variants coming from named UAE variant. Many. Actually, the UAE variant is number one in terms of uh, prevalence or number of detected. Number one is UAE variant. Number two is Hong Kong variant. We also have Spanish variant. The B points is well, yeah, we have Spanish variant. So, and then of course we have the Brazil variant that is not a variant of concern. So there are different kinds of Brazil variant. And there are actually many kinds of UK variants because uh, UK is sequencing so many. So they have a variant of concern and other variants that are not of concern. Brazil also the same. So we have lots of variants, more than 40, more than 60 we have detected so far, but we only uh, flag those with the variants of concern or the variants under investigation. So EVP, we actually have... Um, we are also looking for, for example, variants under investigation or variants of concern from California or New York. We are also on the watch out for these uh, variants. So what's it like? What is NCR? Uh, what is the predominant oh, variant? In NCR, so the unfortunately, unfortunately, the the B one one seven and the B one three five one has already spread. Spread one in South Africa, right? That's yeah, correct. So the, the one that was first described in South Africa has already spread, as well as for the one that was first described uh, from the UK, from Kent, UK, has already spread to all the cities and municipalities of the National Capital Region. And it has also begun to spread in Calabarzon area and in some areas in Luzon. So not many, but we see some cases, for example, in... Uh, in Central Luzon, also in Region 2, and the CAR, Cordillera Administrative Region, actually has uh, a number of 117. So we were able to a certain degree contain the one in Cordillera. You remember the one in Benguet and La Trinidad? I think yes, that yes. was contained. There was massive contact tracing there that was contained. But there is also a branch that went into the Cordillera, not direct from the UK, but through the National Capital Region. So. Oh, so when we looked at our um, tree, uh, we looked at our tree, there was one. So the one from the one in La Trinidad, if you look at the tree, it's direct import, direct import from the UK, if you look at the root of the tree. But the other cases now that we have at the Cordillera Administrative Region is the one that came first to NCR and then from NCR to Cordillera Administrative Region. So that also tells us that um, uh, there are some... Um, leaks, for example, in our quarantine measures when we had returning overseas Filipinos coming into the Philippines. So in the beginning, you remember, the moment they become negative, we ask them to go back to their provinces and that they can just quarantine there. But sometimes the enforcement is not very strong or sometimes the desire of people to meet families and relatives is there. And then after two or three days, they become positive. So then it has begun to spread. So that's why our IATF made some recommendations with um, Six day sample, six day swabbing, right? rather than first day swabbing. But so the we, we the, the changes were implemented, but there is also a possibility that by the time that change happened, for example, the B one three five one has already entered our community, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the B one three five one, which is the one first described in South Africa, the first time we got it, we noticed it was in Pasay. 
Pasay. In Pasay. We uh, were so surprised it was in Pasay because we have been looking since December, December mm-hmm. and January. And then in Pasay, and it was also because there was a surge of cases in Pasay. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then we did deep sampling in Pasay. So we have a lot of samples coming from Pasay and then the National Capital Region. So we did a run together with EB and the NIH to simply focus on the National Capital Region. And then we were able to detect more cases of the 351. So, uh, of course, we have the B117 or the so-called UK variant. A lot of these really we detected from ROFs, from the airport. So even if you know you have a number of 392, some of them, many of these from the 392 were really caught in the airport. Probably 50% of them were caught in the airport and then the about half are in our communities. But the one, the B.1.351, which was first described in South Africa, that one, very few were detected from the airport, at least from the one we have on our sequencing um, results. Not very many came from the airport, only a small number. The rest of the samples we got are from our communities. Community. So it spread so fast, at least in the national capital region. First, we talked, we saw it in a small number of cases in Pasay, but then you see it in the neighboring town of Makati, Manila, and then Calabarzon. And that is in a span of 30 days mm-hmm. or 45 days. It's so fast. So, and we also increasingly see, for example, EDP that people are saying that a lot of the infections are occurring in our homes, right? In our homes. So when one is infected, the entire family is infected. That is a very signature um, observation of variants of concern. And WHO also said that with variants of concern, uh, home quarantine is not really advised because that will infect everyone. Everyone in the household. The other thing people don't know. So now we, we saw from your discussion that The Department of Health, the Epidemiology Bureau, the IATF has depended solely on the Philippine Genome Center for now, for now. surveillance. And we have, uh, in fact, the Department of Science and Technology, with all the money it invested in the PGC, is very happy yeah. because their investment in science and technology has proven value to Correct. us. Not only this, that because I had dinner recently with the WHO representative, uh, Dr. Rabi Abansing here, and he wanted to get in touch with you. Uh, oh, we are already in talks. So maybe you can tell the people why the uh, WHO people was interested in our Philippine Genome Center. So I gave your number and you talked about that. Maybe you can discuss a little without yes. uh, closing everything. Yes, uh, so we are now, uh, together with the Department of Health, we are now in close consultation with the WHO experts also here, as well as in Australia, primarily because of our interest in P.3, you know, number one. Um, we, uh, we, this is a variant under investigation. So what is the protocol in order to study what is a variant under investigation? Because of the signature mutations that P.3 has, we wanted to know whether it is involved in, in Christian's visibility or whether the, uh, the, the symptoms are, are any graver so far, EVP, at least for people, P.3, we have not seen so far any, um, uh, the growth is not, is not as high as the one in the 351 or the South African variant. So we're studying that. And also because we need to, um, so we were able to describe the P.3, the WHO is interested to see what we are doing. And we are also asking the WHO Our government is asking the WHO for help on how to investigate a variant under investigation. What are the protocols that have to be done? That's number one. And also because of the increase in cases in Metro Manila, particularly in the area of genomic epidemiology. You see, genomic epidemiology is a new field. Many of our experts in the DOH are field epidemiologists. So how we incorporate this um, knowledge of genomics and epidemiology together so that we can inform public health and it will have impact on public health is something that is a challenge to everyone. So we're looking for asking WHO, for example, for help in genomic epidemiology so that the sequences that we derive from the Philippine Genome Center will be properly um, utilized so that it will impact the responses of our government public health wise. Not only that, I think now even the region, because the WHO is talking about the role of the Philippine Genome Center in regional public health and uh, surveillance. So EVP, we are soon going to upload with the approval of the DOH. We already have about 5,000 sequences, right? 
So um, uh, we already have the go signal from the Secretary of Health to upload these sequences in public databases, but the EB will just look at the metadata as to validate the metadata. And then as soon as the EB validated, so the Philippine Genome Center is ready to upload about 5,000 of our sequences to the global community. Well, uh, it's been a very interesting discussion about uh, RT-PCR, mutations, variations, biosurveillance, and the future of the Philippine Genome Center. Any final words from you? So uh, what the pandemic has told us, EVP, is that the virus will keep on mutating and mutating if the transmission is not kept low. So it is very, very important for everyone to adhere to the minimum public health standards and to help each other. We have to control the spread of this virus. Otherwise, we will keep on looking and looking for all many local variants that uh, uh, that will develop. Number two, what this pandemic has also told us that science works and that science is here as a power of good and that we have a role to play in public health and ensuring the safety of our citizens and our travelers and also in helping our country return to the new normal as we try to recover uh, economically, mentally, psychologically and health-wise in this pandemic. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Cynthia Saloma of the Philippine Genome Center. It's been a very interesting discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we've seen with this discussion and this episode that today's public health problems and concerns have to be addressed using deep science and new science. The issues of uh, public health are no longer uh, solved by just charts and contact tracing. We are now using very important investments in the field of genomics in the field of uh, sequencing, genetic sequencing, and our Philippine Genome Center investments, and the people that Professor Cynthia Saloma has trained has been a major frontliner, and I would say people who watch our back in the medical field, people who help us in the direction and the policies we make. And truly, to fight a pandemic, we need science. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Vanessa, again.